Good afternoon. If I could encourage everyone to come in and uh, grab a seat uh, or leave. For those people who are left over from the last meeting, it'd be great. So we can uh, go ahead and uh, get things started. We'll start in about two minutes then. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's session. Our first presenter is Dr. Jeff Hazy, an associate professor of surgery at the Ohio State University and the director of surgical endoscopy there. Growing pain following inguinal hernia repair. Dr. Hazy. Well, th well thanks, thanks to Scott and certainly to Sages for inviting us to give this, uh, give this talk. Uh, this is not a, a fun topic, as you can imagine. Um, I'll try to keep you awake as best I can. Not advance the slides. This is a, a disclosure slide. Uh, none of these uh, affiliations will have any impact in my talk today. So William Halstead started this uh, back in 1892 in his uh, classic paper, The Cure of the Ingral Hernia in the Male. If no other field were offered to the surgeon for his activity than herniotomy, it would be worthwhile to become a surgeon and devote entire life to this service, as many, as a, many of us have done. There's perhaps no operation by which the profession at large would be more appreciated than a perfectly safe cure for rupture. Uh, we do anywhere from uh, 600,000 to just under three quarters of a million hernias uh, annually in the U.S. Uh, 50 to 100,000 of these are recurrences. It's a three billion with a B dollar industry. So it's a big industry and uh, it, it makes up a large part of everybody's practice. We don't, I just put this slide, we don't do this kind of thing anymore, but this is, uh, this is really not inguinodynia, it's actually operative, uh, uh, intraoperative pain for a hernia repair. Beginning in around 1970, all of our repairs began to incorporate mesh. Um, they differ in how the mesh is placed, but they, all of them have specific advantages and disadvantages that we have to consider. I want to briefly go over some groin anatomy, and this is from Netter's Atlas. And basically, we're going to be talking about five nerves today when we're talking about inguinodynia. The lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, which is, runs right, right out here laterally, runs below the inguinal ligament to the anterior lateral thigh. The uh, uh, femoral branches come, again, just under the inguinal ligament, running on the anterior thigh. General branch and general femoral nerve, we all know it runs with the spinatic cord structures. Iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerve, which come out laterally almost together and then split as they come down towards the groin and the scrotum. Most of the talk is going to be centered around those, those five nerves as we get further into the, into the discussion. Uh, this is breaking it down a little bit further here. Uh, you obviously see the ilioinguinal nerve, which is going to be just underneath or uh, inferior to the running of the iliohypogastric nerve, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve again, the anterior lateral thigh, general branch of general femoral nerve that we all know here, there's a femoral branch to the, uh, uh, also that it gives off, it comes down here. And the ilioinguinal nerve also gives off branches to the uh, anterior scrotum. I want to include this because, as you, as you know, many of these cases are performed laparoscopically. So not only do we have to think about the anterior nerves uh, for open repairs, but for those of us who do laparoscopic ingral hernia, we have, we have a different, different set of concerns with the laparoscopic approach. Here, this is a cutaway. You see the triangle of doom where all the vessels are in the triangle of pain. A couple of things to note. You, know, you look at all of these names, femoral nerve, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Uh, general branch of general femoral nerve and all these, you don't see the ilio and inguinal and iliohypogastric nerves because you can't really get into them doing them laparoscopically, and we'll touch on that briefly. Um, but here you can see the femoral nerve, general branch of general femoral nerve, and then the femoral branch here, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve as it comes. All of these are below this iliopubic tract. 
So we do laparoscopic repairs. You know, prevention is key when you're talking about inguinodynia. So we do laparoscopic repairs. We're always careful. Never put anything below the iliopubic tract because that's where all the nerves r run, with the exception of the nerves that run in the internal inguinal ring. This is another cutaway, basically the same, the same thing, looking at the right side. Um, the peritoneum is pe uh, being peeled down. The most lateral nerve you'll see is the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. As you move lateral to medial, you'll see the general femoral nerve, with the femoral branch and the general branch, and the femoral nerve, femoral nerve, which actually stays below the iliopubic tract. So this is just offered as a, as a brief review. What do these nerves do? When you take a look at these, look at these five nerves. I talk about the iliolingual nerve, sensory of the proximal medial thigh, iliohypogastric nerve, basically the same. It's really hard to differentiate between these two nerves when people are talking about pain. General femoral nerve uh, to the mons or the scrotum or motor, motor uh, sensation to the cremasteric fibers. Generally, you can differentiate between the iliolingual and iliohypogastric versus the general femoral nerve. Lateral cut uh, femoral cutaneous nerve, again, anterior lateral thigh. If a patient's complaining of anterior lateral thigh pain, doesn't have any other complaints, you can pretty well isolate it to that nerve. And obviously the femoral nerve, which is pretty unusual to, to become involved uh, as a result of an inguinal hernia repair, because obviously that is a little bit more posterior, but it does give sensory branches to the anterior thigh and uh, motor branches to your quadriceps. So the International uh, Association for the Study of Pain defines chronic pain and specifically chronic groin pain as pain persisting beyond the normal tissue healing time assumed to be three months. Because of that, you'll see in the talk here, don't do anything for three months. Leave it alone. Incidence of pain, uh, there's reports actually out there of over 50%, up to 53%. But if you look at the body of literature um, and you, you melt it all down, you take all of it for what it's worth, it's going to run anywhere from 11 to 12%. That's pretty high. Um, you're going to see 10, you do 100 of these cases a year, you're going to see 10 patients in your office or from another practice because they may not go back. Um, uh, per year with chronic groin pain. What can cause it? A number of things can cause it. Intra-abdominal disorders, GU problems, a referred pain from the back and the hip can be felt in the groin. Um, osteitis pubis, which is an important differentiating condition for sports hernias. We won't talk about that today, um, but very often patients who don't have a clinically apparent hernia but have groin pain will present with osteitis pubis, and the only way to, to, uh, to diagnose that and actually rule that out is with an MRI. Stress or avulsion fractures, but the main point I want to highlight is up to 90% people with groin pain will have more than one problem. What do we know? I'm going to go through a series of slides real quick, highlighting exactly what we know at this point. The best treatment is prevention. The younger the age, the higher incidence of pain. See an increased incidence of chronic pain in patients undergoing recurrent hernia repairs, whether it's done open or laparoscopic. So patients who are you're operating on for recurrences will have a higher incidence of chronic pain postoperatively. Non-mesh repairs actually have a higher incidence of chronic pain. Lightweight mesh has been shown to have a lower incidence of chronic pain. There is no difference in chronic pain in patients who undergo routine division of the ilioinguinal or general branch of the general femoral nerve. Been studies that have looked at this where they actually do routine neurectomies as a part of their hernia repair, they have not been able to show a benefit for post op chronic pain. Laparoscopic repairs have a lower incidence of chronic pain when compared to open repairs. We'll, we can get into the arguments about tacks and fibrin glues and all that sort of thing. Um, a TAP or transabdominal preperitoneal laparoscopic repair will have a higher incidence of chronic pain when compared to the totally extraperitoneal repair. The use of fibrin glue to fix mesh in a totally uh, extraperitoneal repair or a transabdominal preperitoneal repair may have a lower incidence of pain when compared to tax. And I say may because there are some equivocal studies, but there are some studies that do show some benefit. And that's true for both metal and possibly absorbable tax. So I'm going to get into the inguinodynia part of the talk. When you're evaluating a patient with uh, chronic pain or inguinodynia, um, it's, it's important to look at the pain and, and try to figure out what kind of pain is it. Is it somatic, is it neuropathic, or is it visceral? Visceral will take out of the equation, I'll briefly touch on it, but really what you're trying to do is differentiate between somatic pain and neuropathic pain. 
So what is somatic pain? It, somatic pain is pain that's localized to a ligamentous insertion to the pubic tubercle. It's basically post-op inflammatory pain. Um, it could be due to staples or sutures that were placed at the time of surgery. Um, the mesh may ball, out, ball up and you get what, uh, a meshoma or something of the like, or post-inflammatory reaction. People who have mesh, low-grade mesh infections may have some type of a somatic pain as opposed to a neuropathic pain. But neuropathic is just what the name implies. It's really uh, in the distribution of the ilioinguinal or general femoral nerves. Uh, the onset is often delayed, meaning the patient doesn't feel this pain in the, in the first one or two weeks postoperatively. And they'll come to your office very often complaining of a tugging, a pulling, a tearing, a stabbing, a burning, or a shooting pain. If they use any of these words, that should raise some suspicion in your mind that you're talking about neuropathic pain. Um, it's often aggravated by ambulation, uh, stooping, or hyperextension of the thigh or the hip, and it's relieved by lying or flexion at the thigh or the hip. Visceral pain is uh, pain seen in males with ejaculation. It's usually due to changes or abnormalities in the periurethral structure. It's very unusual for us to see this, and really, uh, I don't think it has a role in this, this, discussion, this discussion today. So how do you, how do you evaluate these patients? Um, it's a very broad differential uh, when you're looking at patients with inconodynia. Uh, there's non-neuropathic pain. Um, so if somebody comes in with what we describe as somatic type pain, you're always about to be concerned that they're hernia recurrence. Maybe they have a meshoma or they're maybe they're having some excessive scar formation that be con contributing to that. And then you look at the neuropathic type pain and you can start to think of nerve entrapment or neuroma formation. Remember when we divide nerves, uh, one of the downsides of dividing a nerve is it can create a neuroma, which can actually lead to more pain in the future. Um, imaging, um, I think you have to be very liberal about using CT scan and MRI. Uh, CT scan is very difficult to examine uh, patients, maybe actually quite useful. As I mentioned earlier, MRI looking at for some somatic components, some inflammatory components, some osteitis, pubis, or things of that nature uh, may also help in the, uh, in the evaluation of these patients. I highlight these because this is kind of a differentiation between neuropathic pain and inflammatory or somatic type pain. Uh, in neuropathic pain, you often see pain in the damaged area, cold, allodynia, hyperpathia, after sensations, paroxysms, burning pain. Um, but inflammatory or somatic pain, you'll see some response to heat, and they may complain of what's called a throbbing or characterize it as type of a throbbing pain as opposed to uh, what you see with the neuropathic component. Um, part of the evaluation may or may not involve a nerve block. Uh, you can use this very commonly to aid in the uh, diagnosis of this type of pain. Nerve blocks of the ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric nerve are very easy to do, um, look, localizing just kind of a little bit medial to the anterior superior spine. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, both of these nerves actually have a very, um, very common distribution in their sensation. Uh, it's very helpful in distinguishing neuropathic pain as well. Very often, we, we, when we do this, when we do nerve blocks, we want to give them about a six-month to one-year time span to see if this is going to be effective. You don't want to just do a nerve block, give it some time, see if it's going to be effective, give them six months, see if the pain comes back before you're going to make any, uh, any rash moves to taking that patient back to surgery. But in some studies, they've actually said the three-quarters of these patients are resolved at one year. So I'll highlight this. Time. Wait three months. If you're concerned for an occult recurrence, uh, just because you can't feel anything doesn't mean they necessarily ha don't have a recurrence. Get a CT scan of the pelvis. If you're concerned for osteitis pubis, avulsion, or a somatic cause of the pain, maybe consider an MRI. Problem with that, it's expensive. Nerve blocks, part of the evaluation, for, especially for suspected uh, neuropathic etiology as a diagnostic tool. The natural history of uh, inguinodynia, actually, um, within five years, about half these patients will just what they call burn out. They'll just stop having the pain. I don't know if they'll stop having the pain. They'll rewire biofeedback mechanisms, uh, may actually come into play with this, and the, pain, the patients will just cease to have the pain. Um, it disappears about 30 percent, um, mild pain in 45, and uh, co continuous pain in about a quarter of those patients. Uh, pharmacology, uh, gabapentin, tricyclics, amitriptyline being the most common one or analgesics, non-steroidals, and things of that nature. We've talked about regional nerve blocks, acupuncture, and then uh, possible surgery, and I'll briefly touch on each of these. So non-surgical treatments. Obviously, you want to try these first. Um, and it's probably the order you're going to do them in, excluding a couple of these. Uh, non-steroidals and rest, 
physical therapy, especially if it's somatic type pain, send them to the physical therapist. Uh, acupuncture, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, kind of plus or minus. I don't, it's certainly not a part of my practice. Uh, neuropathic analgesics, obviously uh, something we can do quite easily in the office. Um, you also want to make sure you exclude other chronic pain syndromes. Uh, remember, very often hip disease and chronic hip pain and uh, joint pain within the hip can be referred to the groin. And then obviously nerve blocks we talked about earlier. Surgical treatments, try this last. If you've done a laparoscopic repair and you've put in tacks, think about staple removal, re-exploring those patients and removing those staples. Um, the other thing you can do is you can take out the mesh, plus or minus a neurectomy. And I'll t briefly touch on some data regarding that. You can do a neurect neurectomy alone. Very often it's guided by the nerve distribution. Obviously, the first two you're going you're gonna to deal with are the ileoingital and the iliohypogastric nerves. Uh, general femoral nerve is probably third on the list. And then as we move further down, the general branch of general femoral nerve. And then the lateral fem femoral cutaneous nerve is the most easily identifiable uh, uh, site for uh, pain and uh, most responsive to a neurectomy. Um, anywhere from 60 to 100 percent are cured or improved. Uh, you talk about triple neurectomy, 80 to 85 percent will have complete re resolution of their pain. Remove the mesh. There's really not a whole lot of data that I can offer you to support mesh removal. I think you've got to think about what you're doing in those patients before you're going to go ahead and remove the mesh. Are you going to come back with a recurrent hernia and are you actually going to help their pain? Um, I would use mesh removal purely as a last resort and I would put tack or suture removal well above uh, mesh removal. I want to thank you. Answer any questions.